So I think I'll start with handing it over to Carrie. Um, and she's gonna tell us a little bit. Carrie um, is with the Upstate New York uh, chapter of the American Printing History Association. And like I said, this is not just a Hamilton event. This really came about because AFA came to us and said, can we do this event where we show uh, how Howard Ironworks? And we said, yes, we'd be happy to work with you. So I will hand it over, Carrie. Thank you so much. Yeah, I am so excited to be here and that so many of us got together to put this, this presentation together. Uh, I want to say welcome to everybody. Thank you for tuning in to learn more about Higher Powered Ironworks. See more of their amazing collection. I saw a snippet of the, the collection and it's incredible. So I wanna say thank you to uh, our member, Stephen Sword, who got the idea together with his work from, from Howard Ironworks for uh, Leanna and Nick, Stephanie and Amelia Fontenelle for, for giving us the idea to all get together. So it's, it's really exciting to see this connection made with all of us to all of you. Uh, it's exciting to see what, what happens when, when friends in ink join other friends in ink and make fun events like this happen. Thank you if you're a current member of AFA and or Hamilton, so we can offer these sort of events. Um, if not, consider joining so that we could keep doing this. Um, make sure to check out our conferences coming up in the fall. We have AFA's Impresos conference coming up on October 22nd and 23rd, and Hamilton's Ways Goo is happening on November 5th and 6th. So hope you can uh, join us for that. And um, yeah, thank you so much for uh, tuning in. Thank over you, Carrie. <laughs> I think we'll turn it over to Stephen because he's got a little thing to say as well. Yeah, um, I'm excited to be part of this and to uh, give Nick and Leanne an opportunity to present the wonderful work they've done. Um, I've had the opportunity. I, I'm fortunate in a few ways. I'm fortunate because I happen to join them in living north of the international border in southern Ontario. Um, but I'm also particularly fortunate because I've had a chance to visit the museum several times. And even back when it was still really just germinating as an idea in the, in the minds, uh, the twinkle in the eyes of Leanna and Nick. Uh, and uh, so uh, I, I have that advantage of having seen this live and in person, as maybe someday you all will as well. Um, I just wanted to, to mention a couple of things that I'd sort of like to perk your ears open to as, as Nick takes you through the tour. Um, in North America, it's very easy for us to be a little bit insular, uh, but the, the parent company that, that produced Howard uh, Ironworks um, was an international com company. Uh, they serve all around the world. And as a result, um, this collection is more international than many you'll have an opportunity to visit in North America. Uh, and, and that's, that's a, a really wonderful aspect of the breadth of the collection. Um, the other thing about the breadth of the collection is that although the focus may be uh, letterpress, it is by no means exclusively letterpress. And there is uh, material uh, demonstrating lithography and offset lithography and intaglio and goes on into bookbinding um, so it is a very broad, uh, broadly based museum, and uh, you'll see that as, as the tour goes on. But uh, um, these these two people with their with their staff have created something really quite remarkable. They have a library to support the collection that is quite astounding um, and and beautiful. Everything they do is beautiful. Um, they uh, they restore presses in in a way that some museums wouldn't and many museums would, would not have the ability to do. Uh, and that stems out of what their, the earlier uh, Howard Graphic uh, Industries was about. And, and so they're able to do just wonderful things in restoring the presses uh, and, and all the other equipment that they have. So um, I hope that you'll enjoy this tour as much as I've enjoyed visiting Leanna and, and Nick over the years. Um, and that someday you'll have a chance to follow up this tour with a real visit. For sure. That was absolutely wonderful. Thank you for that great introduction. Um, I will give a little bit more about it, but saying how beautiful everything is was perfect because you are spot on. Um, I'll do a short introduction just to give you guys a little bit of what we're gonna see is beautiful today. Um, after many years directly involved in the printing industry, Liana and Nick Howard set about to build a museum of printing history with focus on machinery from the 1830s to the 1950s. 
This period was an exciting time, not only for world by technology, but also improvements to the printing press. Howard Ironworks is supported by world-class talent in order to restore and present equipment just as it would have been leaving the original factories. The current collection features an impressive selection of iron presses, cylinders, platens, and bindery equipment. In addition, the library also features a collection of vintage printing related books, technical and trade journals, and the Howards are custodians of Howard Graphic Equipment Limited, uh, a supplier and rebuilder of printing and converting equipment. The business started in 1967. Nick Howard has worked in the printing trade since he was a young boy, following a family tradition of several generations. And Leanna Howard has not only involved, um, has not only been involved, but she's instrumental in leading the Howard group of companies and shares the same passion for the printing trades. I'm so glad that we can share more today. And thank you, Leanna and Nick, for taking the time to do this. So I'm going to hand it over um, and thank you everybody for joining us today. Hi, I just want to say a few words, obviously. <laughs> for the glowing uh, recommendations in that. And thank you to Stephanie and Hamilton Woodtype, and Stephen and Carrie uh, for giving us the opportunity to hang out with you guys. Um, I wonder if I can just right now go to the video. Is that okay, Stephanie? I think that's perfect timing. Thank you, Liana. Okay, let me do that. I hope I don't mess this up. <laughs> It'll be great. We're so excited to see it. Okay. lovely. Thank you. Do we want to get a tour with Nick? Yeah, I think we can hand this over to Nick. <laughs> that sounds good. Okay.
Hi, I'm Nick. Nick. So good to see you. Nice to see you too. So here we are in the museum and I'll kind of take you through uh, what we've got here. You've seen some of it already on the video, so there's not much more I can show you, but um, I'll, <laughs> I'll do that. I'm going to switch the camera over. So we'll start on uh, a few kind of uh, basic, uh, basic comments Leanne and I probably want to make about the museum. Uh, as Stephen's already mentioned, we, we were in the industry before, but we were not really acting as printers. We were buying and selling equipment, large equipment, offset mainly, and uh, we were always rebuilding and fixing problems. Everything was a problem in, in, in the industry. You, you, if you bought a machine, you had to repair it. You had to find out what was wrong with it. You had to test print it. But being a printer, no. In fact, I remember even many, many decades ago on service calls, I couldn't wait to get out of a print shop after I'd fixed the press. So this is a little bit different now because now we're fixing equipment up. We're looking for interesting machines that maybe are a little bit more unique and that you wouldn't really find in, in some of the typical North American museums and restoring them and actually producing on them. Um, and so it becomes a bit of a, a new challenge for us because we're, we're almost like uh, many people that are joining the, the, the letterpress world. Uh, we're, we're almost starting from scratch sometimes. So in the museum, we've got a variety of different machines. We've got the, the typical German stop cylinder press, which you didn't see very often. I don't recall hardly at all in North America. This is uh, a press that we finished. This is made by Heidelberg. It's from 1920. Uh, it's an ex a model exquisite. And this is before Heidelberg called themselves Heidelberg. They called themselves Schnell Press and Fabric in Heidelberg. Uh, we got this machine in uh, Hamburg and uh, we restored it and we're actually ready to print on it once we, uh, we get something to print for it. Um, it's about a 27 inch stop cylinder press, hand fed, powered delivery. There's a similar machine to that uh, European again, which is kind of a bit of an odd duck in North America. It's called a Mercedes. Some people call them the Glockners. Um, it's also a stop cylinder press. It works a little similar to the Wharfdale, except it has the same stop cylinder mechanism as the Heidelberg over here. And this is an automatic uh, feed, automatic delivery. We've actually printed on this machine. This one's made in Holland in 1954. And uh, it actually, it actually, again, we're not printers, but it actually prints pretty, pretty good. And it's an easy, nice, easy press to run. There's still a lot of these around, even though it wasn't made to run to die cut or die cut heavier stock. A lot of people, you'll still find them being used. They were also made in South America, this, this, this type of machine. They were made in China. They were made in Britain. Uh, Holland, of course, they started uh, out being made in Leipzig. Um, and so I, we find it kind of an interesting machine. It's really fun to watch. This is, uh, of course, you have to, you have, to have uh, proof process if you're going to be teaching anything. And if I know anyone, it's Hamilton that has a whole load of proof presses. This is one that we purchased in Holland. It's a graphics, it's a 72 centimeter, 28 inch press, and it has an automatic feed delivery. It's 380 volt with a neutral, which we don't have here in North America. So we did a workaround with a transformer. It will, it's got all sorts of features, including an ink fountain, which we is in a box down there that we've never actually used. So if you did long runs, it's a Dutch type height which is a deeper type height than our American type height. Uh, but that's not a problem either. So we just shimmed it up with some offset plates. 
Can you show uh, that ink fountain, please, Nick? Oh, well, the ink fountain would go on these brackets here and it would just sit like a regular ink fountain. I oh. should have I should have anticipated somebody might ask me that question. Well, ink fountains for those presses are like unicorns to me. Yeah, well, you can see part of it here. It's pretty heavy and the roller comes with it, the rollers up here. And that's probably why it never really got used much. Uh, from, uh, we got this near Groningen, but it was at a school, a uh, graphic school in, uh, in Groningen, uh, the college town in Holland, Northern Holland. So we had some friends of ours go get it and pack it up for us. This is an offset press. We have this here. Uh, we actually sold some machines like this in our day. It's a 40 inch machine. It was also made by Heidelberg. It's a bit of a bitter memory for Heidelberg if you bring up the name Rotospeed today because it was just not a very good machine. It didn't register very well. This one's here because it's also got uh, what we call a chain transfer between the units, which is right between here. This machine's built, I think, in 1966, and the chain transfer bars were made out of aluminum, which was something that the Germans came up with during World War II because they couldn't get enough bauxite to make aluminum. So we have it here as a bit of an Etzel. So if you had a car museum, you have an Etzel, then the same idea. But this one actually didn't perform very well. They made these rotor speeds up until 1974. And of course the Speedmaster, the, the current name for the flagship model is still made. We also did some feeder heads to, to be a little different. Uh, this is a feeder head that is off of a 2016 uh, Heidelberg Speedmaster 106. And uh, we decided to hang it on, on the ceiling. And at the same time, we had some other feeder heads that we kept in our collection for machines we'd scrapped, et cetera. So what we did was we overhauled those. Some were kind of unique. We have one up there that was off of a road speed numbering machine that we took on trade from Canadian banknote. That's this one up here, it's made by Spies. Spies was a long time manufacturer in Germany of, of feeders and printing presses. And this is a unique one. This is, uh, we took this off of a Bremer folder. This is actually an Ellis feeder. It's made in, um, made in Sweden. Ellis was used on the Solna, if anybody remembers that model press. And there's a small one. This one was on a, on a uh, crab tree. So uh, Spies sold their feeder heads around the world to other manufacturers, including the English. And Crabtree is an English manufacturer. I remember that one because we scrapped it. On the wall up above, we have uh, not, nothing rare or anything, but the, the map on the left is the largest sheet ever printed on an offset press. It's an 81 inch sheet that was printed on the Rapita one, the Koenig of Bauer 205 uh, press, which they still make. The French one has been rolled up since the early eighties. It was a test sheet that we ran for a Harris 77 inch press. We sold to Paris for a roadside. And I remember that printer, he brought his own film with him. And if uh, anyone remembers the Michael Jordan Skyman, we were at that show in Chicago. I think it was, I forgot which print it was. And they were being printed by Man Rowland and they sold like hotcakes. And somebody said people were scalping them afterward. So we, luckily we kept that. So we're, we're always trying to add something a little bit different to the museum that maybe they, people won't see uh, at other museums. And uh, even though there's a lot of print related things here, um, we have a lot of 
we used to have a lot of women that came by the museum and they were always interested in typography and whatnot. But if they brought their husbands or boyfriends, they were always interested in this kind of stuff. So these are sets of wrenches that I've kept for uh, the whole history of our company. There are a lot of really old wrenches here, including in the center. These ones are Whitworth wrenches. Because at the time, especially in Canada, unfortunately for us, we ended up with a lot of British made machinery. And if we carry over here, we have a couple other proof presses that we've done. This is another interesting machine coming up. This is an SRDW. It's also made by Heidelberg. You can't really talk about printing without talking about Heidelberg. This we bought in Berlin and uh, it was in a bindery and it was designed as a two color perfecting press, printing, meaning you're pr pr printing on both sides of the sheet at the same time using uh, relief plates. And it was really designed specifically for the pocketbook industry because of the sheet size. It fit the German DIN size and you could produce like 32 pages or 16 pages of flats uh, to produce pocketbooks. Of course, Heidelberg was a little late coming out with this machine. Offset had already started to well overtake uh, a letterpress and nobody really wanted to use it for letterpress. In fact, the, the place we got this from, the bindery, it was a trade bindery, they were using it to die cut which it was never meant to do with laser thin dyes. So we're really looking forward to this because they didn't make many of these, just a little over a hundred. And I'd only ever seen one in Germany and I thought it was ridiculous. And I said, well, we must somewhere, somewhere down the road, we have to get one before they all get scrapped. And uh, we restored this one, did a little bit of work to it, rebuilt the compressors, a few other things. And we're just about ready to uh, start printing on this. We have another similar machine to that, uh, albeit older. It's, uh, it's a two color rotary letter press. Most of these got scrapped because uh, if you didn't have the plates, you couldn't print and offset was taking over this market too. Uh, we were lucky to get our hands on this because this really never ran very much. It's almost like new. When we had it, we had to do very little. Funny thing about this is we got it in Salt Lake City as, a, as part of a trade on some presses we sold. And it had a Canadian uh, dealer name on it. Sears was the Canadian agent for Heidelberg. So somehow it ended up going to Vancouver to a customer and then ended up in Utah. And uh, I don't think it was ever used there. So that's kind of interesting. We've got uh, some more common machines. Uh, this Kelly Model B is from about 1936. It's, uh, we restored it. We have it kind of ready to go. It's, uh, it, it's a very popular machine that you still see, the B and the C and sometimes the, the extended delivery um, ones. We're quite happy to have this because again, there was it's, it's really a part, especially in North America, our history. This is a uh, Komori. It's a very early model hand-fed lithographic press. We actually got this from a dealer we knew in England who had bought it from Southeast Asia somewhere. And uh, we represented Komori up here in Canada for 10 years. So we thought that was a good addition. This we've had for quite a while. This is a kind of an unusual machine and I don't know if you'd see another one of those uh, or really because this is, uh, this is called a metal decorating machine. This is actually an offset machine made by Ho and this is, predates the modern offset press which was about 1904. This had a dampener uh, and you would put a stone in here Right now we've got a big steel, uh, a big cast piece, piece of cast in there so we could put an offset plate. But originally you would put a stone like this, lift it and put it inside this machine. Hope it doesn't break. 
and then have to re-level a stone each time because as you polish the stone, of course, it gets smaller. And if you were doing five or six color job, you'd have to be lifting the stone out. So, but this particular machine was designed to print on metal. They call it tin printing, which is never tin, but uh, they call it that. Uh, and uh, they call it metal decorating. And at one time, as we all remember, I'm sure everybody that's uh, dialed in today remembers the three, the three piece cans. They were very common. So three piece cans were all flat and then you had a lid in the top. When the two piece cans came out, the aluminum cans that kind of changed everything. We got this from a nameplate company that closed in lower Manhattan. And we've uh, re restored it. We put an inverter drive on it. Um, our pressman at the time, our press demonstrator, I tried to convince him to print on it. And he just gave, kept, kept giving me dirty looks. So we never actually printed on it, but I'm sure we could. And this uh, has a blanket cylinder, which is the orange, has an impression cylinder, which is on top. So it's actually a real offset press before the offset press. And of course, metal decorating uh, in England around 1875, they were already, somebody was already, Barclay, I think, was already printing on, on metal um, be, well before somebody thought to try it with uh, paper. So it's a, it's a nice piece of history and it's built on a, a whole flat, a uh, whole cylinder press bed. And it's really heavy, really heavy. Hey, before and, you walk too far, Nick, do you mind telling us about those giant posters on the wall? Because I think they're intriguing a lot of us. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, sure. No, it's great. Yeah. Uh, these, we, uh, we have one of our good customers printed these for us. We, uh, Leanna found these in one of the uh, trade books. The American Pressman is obviously one of the uh, books that was out at the time. I forgot how old this one is, but we just love that, uh, that image. And we thought, why don't, wouldn't that, I can't get the shadow. I can't get the glare. Out. Why, why, why didn't, why don't we print that one? Of course, this one's a bit odd too, because this is uh, Hosman Steinberg. This is before World War II and he's pointing to the Zeppelin. So we thought this was kind of neat and it's all about selling you ink. And the ink companies in Germany and England, and of course, in North America, they spent lots of money on advertising the printers. One of the best examples, of course, is, and you've probably seen this before, it's quite common now, Alton, Alton Weiberg, the dragon. And uh, that's a really nice, that's a really nice picture too. So we decided to put them up there. Thank you, those are beautiful. So where was I? Okay, this is one of our oldest machines. Uh, this is a potter, potter press. We know that it wasn't made by him in Rhode Island, Westerly. It was made uh, by uh, Cottrell. Cottrell became a really big press manufacturer, got into newspaper web presses, and then in the early 50s was bought by Harris. But whole, uh, Potter was a salesman initially in New York. And so the only thing that differentiates this press from one that Cottrell would have sold himself was this little cast plate. Uh, we found this down in Southern Illinois and it was all apart and literally all apart. Didn't know if it was missing things, but we just loved the frame. So what we decided to do was well, we bought it and we decided to try and restore it. When we did, we realized the fly, which is this wood part here that actually takes the sheet and delivers, that was missing. The castings, these, uh, these castings here, we're all, we made all these, uh, what we call a suicide cam right here, this was missing. Uh, and a bunch of other parts were missing and a few breaks and uh, this, uh, this takeoff shaft real here is just some dolly wheels that we bought and we turned down uh, because we didn't, uh, we had the brackets, but we didn't have the shaft 
so we uh, we restored it and uh, and we're quite pleased with it. It has what we call a mangled drive, which was a very common drive used both sides of the Atlantic, and it looked like it had some original rollers with it. And we thought, oh, that's great because we found a name on there and it said Beacon. And then on another roller, it said Burl, on the other side, it said Burling. So we thought, oh, great. We got to find out where this was. It was at a prob probably a small town newspaper. Must have been called the Burling Beacon. And we still haven't found it. So we're really not too sure, but we do know from this model, and I don't think you'll see another one of these, of this particular model, that it was built no later than 1865. So that's the end of the Civil War. So you think there's a lot of history here with this. And all we had to go by was, was a bit of a, a sketch drawing that we finally found somewhere uh, that gave us a rough idea of how to make the uh, fly. And this is a total hand crank. This is all Armstrong. There's no electricity. This was never on electricity. It doesn't have any pulleys or anything like that. It's a simple machine, but uh, I'm glad we restored it. And if you wonder why it's that color, that's an old German raw red color, a rust red color, is because when we got it, it somebody had sandblasted it who knows, decades before, and it had this deep red color. So we got so tired of looking at it. When we came to decide on what to paint it, we decided, why don't we just paint it something similar? Well, that's what we did. And up here, we've got uh, some platen presses we need to make some more room in the museum. So these ones we had already done before. And, uh, and, uh, there's nothing really specific here. Uh, we've got an Arab, uh, we've got a lightning. We've got the good and the bad machines. There's a lot of these platens are pretty trashy. You know, they were, they were sold for a cheap price. That's about the green one there with the red flywheel, that's Belgian. Uh, this little one here is a typical German uh, platen, good platen. A uh, couple made in New York. Uh, one on the end there is a copy of Gordon's Platen that's made in Toronto. We have some, uh, some cutters, paper cutters. Up top, we have an old Malty from 1932 that uh, somebody donated to us. And uh, so we've got them up there because we've actually got probably too many Platen presses. Uh, we've got an ink mixer uh, here, which we uh, we had in our collection for a long time because it looks just like a one of those dough maker things in, in a bakery, uh, and it's it's fairly old. We have finished. Uh, See if I can get this thing to work here. We finished this press. This little uh, proof press is 219. It's a power 219. It, uh, it was a bit of a mess when we got it. Because a lot of times, especially in a company where if they're doing, if they were using it, they haven't used it for a long time, parts are missing somebody's damaged something. So this one here, the guard was all broken here. Um, I think the uh, cam had come loose when it came forward and it smashed all this. So we, it's aluminum. So we welded that here in house. We changed it over to 220 from it was running at uh, 440. Shows how old it was. And um, it actually runs very well, but it's really super dangerous. I mean, we, it's one of these things that you, you really can't, you'd have to turn it into a hand crank. I did find, find a, uh, another guard because they made this into a hand crank. So if, if we do decide to get rid of it, we could, somebody could put a handle on it and then it'd be good to work with. But there's so many pinch points on this thing. It, it just take your hand right off. 
Yeah, I like that you talk. Um, do you mind, Nick, if I ask two quick questions before you Certainly. move on to the next one? Uh, somebody asked if there was an old school cabinet on the shelf uh, way up there as well. Um, uh, oh, sure. Uh, we have uh, we have a couple cabinets that we restored that we didn't really have any room for. There's a there's a, a Hamilton. Oh, I should have ah. mentioned that. Yeah, <laughs> I'll pay uh, you later. <laughs> actually, both of those are made by Hamilton. Mm -hmm. the, the one on the right, we took out the uh, riglet uh, frame for it because we built some shelves for it. We thought we could put some little odds and sods in there. Uh, okay. That's a very interesting cabinet. That's uh, uh, It was an ATF catalog. It was something that the Hamilton made for, it was a system. Mm -hmm. I forgot what it was, but it's got a lot of drawers for sorts and different things. And the, the one on the left is every, everybody's probably seen those before, but it's got a cast iron top. It hasn't got the granite top. Nice. And we and, just didn't have any room for them. Well, and I'm going to ask before I forget, um, because I don't want to interrupt your tour, but there, it looked like there was a pink press. So I just wondered if that will be a part of the tour at some point today, because there have been a couple of requests. <laughs> oh, absolutely. You know what? I, I, if you don't mind, I'll just do it now so I don't. No, forget. I love it. You're an amazing cameraman and tour giver. This is great. Oh well, thank you. How come Leanna never says that? <laughs> oh, there she is. Oh my God, that's a princess press. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's. Uh, it's not a. It's not a super old press. I don't know if you can pick that up or not. Mm hmm. So Figgins isn't a super uh, uh, a super manufacturer of, of the, these these machines. This one was the smallest one we had. I forgot the size, twelve eighteen or something, whatever the sizes were back then. But we wanted to do something a little different with this one. So with our with our work with the Lighthouse for Grieving Children, which is uh, our charity that we support down the street here. We, we thought, why don't we do something and maybe we can uh, donate it to our hospital. We have a new hospital here in Oakville. Uh, it'll cheer people up and actually brighten their day. We have lots of Colombians. This was the smallest one. So we thought this might be better. Um, so we built a base for it, but then COVID hit and we still haven't worked out a deal with uh, possible because we just wanted to donate it to them and if they wanted I could go over there and print on it or something if they had an event at least it would cheer people up when they're going to the hospital so we decided to keep it positive so there's no black on it so we used the purple uh, for the platen and uh, we just kind of decorated it that's lovely I love the story behind it too I'm glad we asked about it um, and that is a lot of Colombians <laughs> That's yeah, these are just a few. Amazing. Yeah, these are a few of the more interesting manufacturers. This one here is uh, made by uh, William Carpenter, who took over. If anyone knows the history of Climber, took over the business when his partner Climber and Dixon's uh, Dixon died. And this is Wood and Co. They ended up, I think, uh, they were the children of another company called Woods that bought all the assets from, of, from the climber bankruptcy because they did go bankrupt. I'm not sure which this one is because this one's 1861. And we are lucky that we got plates. Some of these, unfortunately, we don't have plates. This one is, we know this one was, I think, Wood and, Wood and Charwitz. That's right. We know that from the design because they're, they're all a little bit different, the manufacturers. So we had that plate made, but we couldn't put a serial number or a date because we just don't really know. We can, we can estimate how old it is. And this is a pretty boring looking Colombian that was made by the ultimate uh, competitor of Climber. Um, uh, who made the Albion, a uh, guy by the name of Cope. And, and so we, we decided to do this one because it's almost like Ford making a Chevy. 
it did, it, they, whatever happened, the, the Colombian re, remained very, very popular, even with the British and even with all the Americana all over it, which is telling a story, even though the Albion, which is, we've all seen those, uh, was a not a bad machine. It was much more British, you know, in appearance. The name was British. Uh, we've got quite a few uh, Albions in our collection and, uh, from different ages. And do you mind if I ask, as you restore things, what methods do you use to find out what were originally on the press, either from paint jobs to pieces that are missing? How do you kind of go about that process? Well, that's a little bit tricky. Um, on the on the Colombians, it's it's just mission impossible. You're just not going to be able to be credible by telling anybody what color it was or how it left. I've never found anything other than, as Leanna pointed out, some some book wrote about it, some parts being gilted, and you can understand why they would want to say that because it's it's a very easy machine to decorate. It's very hard not to decorate it. You know, when you finish it, you just want to decorate it, but how do we know? Uh, it varies. This is a good example of maybe what we went through. This is a very old uh, uh, Golding, number seven. And I think it's from 1886. So we got this in New Jersey. It was missing a bunch of stuff. We made the side table. We kind of filled the machine back up again. But we did notice when we scraped the paint off, we did find just above the Japaning, which is what they used to use, we found things like this. Now we couldn't save that. And it's in a ridiculously stupid place because you can't even see it when you're operating the machine. But nonetheless, we decided we had to restore it. And we also found what looked like the original pattern that they used on this particular press. Now, whether it was a guy named Bob that was at the end of the assembly line that was painting them all different, I, and we don't know, but uh, we, we, we came pretty close here to what probably was on this machine at the time. Stunning. And we did that because we, uh, some of this we added because we saw something in, a, in an ad or something that they had something like this. But mm -hmm. this we we kept because we cut bits and pieces of it. Uh, so this is a good example of how we do it. And then there's other machines that um, that um, we find out later on that, uh, or we've got witnesses when we've cleaned it. This particular one is uh, Pouts, which we finished just a little while ago. And we think this is early 50s, but when we scraped off the old gray, because we got this in Belgium, we saw this color. And then I matched this color up with our old German RAL raw book to get an idea of what, what was the, the color back then. And I found this raw number and through our paint supplier just ordered it. And we decided to paint it this color. It's a little bright, but uh, we're pretty sure that's what the color looked like. And so that's a typical German color, especially in the 60s, even other companies in the industry use that color. Nick, can I interrupt you for a second? It's Stephen. Yes, Stephen. Um, and you may be nearby a, a prop to tell the story of the, uh, uh, the Howard Ironworks name. Um, oh, you mean the paper cutter? Yes, yeah. Yeah. Oh, well, Howard Ironworks, I, it, it, it was founded in, uh, in and around Buffalo, New York. Uh, and they made a lot of different things. They made, they made uh, vices, uh, which we ended up buying a vice here, Howard Ironworks. And I knew them from these, the hand fed or, or hand lever cutters. They also made some power cutters. They made some bolt making equipment. They made fire hydrants. If you Google Howard Ironworks, you'll probably find out quite a bit about that company. In 1906, they were bought by a company called JD Cousins. That company still exists today. I talked to the owner of JD Cousins. They're in the boiler uh, business. 
a relatively big company too. And I asked him if we could use the name because Leanne and I thought, what are we going to call the museum? And we knew this cutter. So we, and it's our last name. So we said, well, maybe we'll just use that. And he absolutely loved the idea and he, he granted us permission to do that. So that's how our name came about or the name of the museum came about. That's a uh, three hole drill made in St. Louis by Barry, very dangerous drill uh, because it had what they call spiral clean outs, which are these shafts here, these augers, which would go down through the drill bit here and force all the chips up. That was great. But when they got to the top, they just mangled up and everything here. Uh, it was a very noisy drill. We've had this a long time where we restored it, um, hugely heavy. And then we have some uh, examples of German uh, guillotines or paper cutters. Again, they, their, their paper cutters are a bit ridiculous. And I can probably show you with this one. This is made by the originator of the Heidelberg company, Andreas Hamm, when he was still in Frankenthal before they moved to Heidelberg. But this has a typical type of a German, uh, not just German, even the French and Belgians made them like this, where the American, the American guillotine or paper cutter, I've just brought it down, this, uh, goes the other way and it's much more efficient and easier to use. The German paper cutter had the lever going the opposite way. So you needed twice as much room for your paper cutter. So Stephanie, uh, instead of a ham hang, you've got a ham chop. That's right. <laughs> we had to yeah. get there at some point. <laughs> yeah, uh, Krause is, uh, was a very big, they're still in business in Bielefeld, uh, but before the war they were in Leipzig and they were a very big manufacturer of paper cutters. A lot of their paper cutters were sold in North America. I don't, I didn't see anything like this. This one I'm showing you right now. This one we got in Zagreb with a little bindery that we bought. And this was a uh, wire stitching machine. And this has got an interesting story as well. Even though Smythe had already made a wire or a thread sewing machine, uh, a fellow by the name of Hale uh, in Ohio who was an inventor, came up with this idea. In 1876, he was tasked with producing all the books for the exposition in Philadelphia. He designed this machine and he went looking for somebody to make it for him because they were going to stitch the books. And they went to a, a, a firm of, with two Germans by the name of Bremer in Philadelphia. And Bremer built it for them. But then shortly thereafter, they took off for Germany. They were German and they ended in Le up in Leipzig and they started building these machines and calling them their own. And it started to language, you know, it started to grow that it was original Bremer. And Bremer became a very big manufacturer, especially up until World War II and even after. Um, and the whole concept of how they started their business was the American design, uh, inventor who actually came up with this. The problem with these wire stitch books, and anybody has any old German books probably has a few, is the staples would rust and crack and break. And of course, then the pages came out. You'll see one of these at the uh, Gutenberg Museum as well. They have almost the exact same one. I think theirs is older than this. Well, Nick, with so many pieces, it's very interesting, especially working at a museum here. I'm intrigued if things come to you, like people find you and or do you actively go out to make sure you get pieces that like tell more about like so that you can round out what you guys have? Do you go looking often? How does how do pieces find their way to you? Well, uh, most of the equipment uh, that you're you're seeing, uh, we found it. Uh, through knowing someone, this this paper cutter, for instance, is Connersby, is a British uh, was a British maker. They, he made uh, cylinder presses like Wharfdale's too, 
made a lot of things. It's a ridiculous cutter when you a paper cutter when you think about it now, especially on a Monday morning if you're bringing the clamp down. And this is solid cast that would probably wake you up and send you to the dentist. Um, this one we got in Amsterdam. Uh, it was a dealer we used to deal with their HDO. And they also had a little collection of antique machines. And I, every time I was there, and I was there a lot, I, I spent my time looking at them. And, and uh, I got a promise out of them if they ever wanted to get rid of them, that they would sell them to me. And that's what happened. So we bought quite a few of uh, their machines. We also bought this beautiful uh, Klein Forst and Bone, which is a a German stop cylinder machine, but it's, but it's a little different because it uses the planetary drive, which is a big rack here. A few manufacturers use this. Kenny Bauer did, uh, for sure. Klein, uh, Klein and Bone, which is the name here, are, are folks that actually came, gravitated from Mann in Augsburg. And of course, Mann started from somebody that Reichenbach who worked for Koenig. So everything seems to head back to Koenig and Koenig at Bauer. Kleinforce and Bone over the years did quite well. Eventually uh, they bought uh, or they started, they merged with the American Miller machine which was made in Pittsburgh. And uh, they lasted technically until 1990 and then Man Roland bought them. They weren't building these types of machines, but this is quite an interesting, typical German stop cylinder machine. Nice little delivery, fairly easy to work on. And they stuck with this design for a long, long time. Well, and we're coming up to our last five minutes, but we have a couple of good questions in the chat that I'll just keep asking Nick. Um, they want to know how is the museum and those acquisitions funded? If you don't mind sharing more. Oh yeah, uh, we don't do this for money. So we fund everything ourselves. So like all the rest of us. <laughs> yes, it's, exactly. It's absolutely stunning though. that The rest of us don't do quite this. This is absolutely amazing. Um, I do have one more question. Oh, I apologize, Hans. I missed it when you were at the press, but what was the purpose of the planetary gears? Could you rotate the form um, on that last press we were looking at? Yeah, the planetary gear, you've got the large gear that you saw and then a smaller inside gear that basically rotates around the inner radius of that gear, mm -hmm. which allows the, uh, the bed to move backward and forward. It's a little... It's not like a scotch motion. It's a little bit different. It's just an offset lever. Uh, it didn't go very far and last very long because uh, there was too many moving parts and it was too delicate and jarring would break the rack gear. And of course, when you broke the rack gear, you were done because that was something that, that was all cast in one piece. Yeah. This is the uh, example of the stop cylinder press, which we we showcased earlier and what we decided to do is we took a, a we had a french machine and we scrapped it so we put a handle on it to show you all how it actually works and that's all it does it works off the cam which is driven by the the, the drive gear which is driving the rest of the machine and it keeps that impression cylinder at in register and at zero and then brings it back into mesh with the bed as the bed wants to come back. So we decided to make a, a little, uh, a little uh, display for people. That's amazing. I, <laughs> Nick, I feel like I'm there. Your tour does such a good job of showcasing like the size of what you have there and all the special pieces. Your stories make this an absolutely amazing tour. Oh, thank you. I'm sorry I'm having so much trouble trying to get this robot arm thing to. The robot arm is it. great. I love it. This is, uh, these are displays of different disciplines within printing. Uh, so we did some wood, uh, we did some cuts here that uh, was some cuts, uh, some, uh, some 
lead there, but mostly cut. So you could see what the cut looked like. And then you could see what the print was like, like, so I just printed these on the, the Vandercook and you just get, people get a better idea. We have some things that don't, maybe don't really fit very well in a museum, in the print museum, but cameras are certainly part of it. And this is, a uh, we actually had this donated. A uh, friend of ours knew somebody who was going in a home and wanted to donate it to a museum. It's a very nice camera collection. And these are lenses that we've collected over the years from graphic uh, repro cameras. And we've got some pretty old ones here too. And of course we've got the obligatory uh, cabinet so that you can see uh, some things that uh, were used to produce money. This big ring that I'm focusing on now, that's off a of Heidelberg Speedmaster that we sold Canadian banknote. And that came out of American banknote in Nashville. And it just shows how numbering, uh, numbering is still done on banknotes today. So I kept one of the rings. We all joke course, that we print money, but you can say <laughs> print money. <laughs> oh yeah, well I wish, we, <laughs> I, I wish we could say that, but we did a lot of business with Canadian banknote. They're a really nice company first plastic notes we supplied the press for. Oh, amazing. And this is, this is a, a door off of the Rotospeed that was that numbering machine that we took on trade. Um, and we kind of guesstimated how, with the impression count on it, how many dollars worth of value this thing must have had go through it. But we turned this into a a podium or a lectern <laughs> and we made it ourselves. So when we Good. have events, hopefully again, you can go up here and you can stand and we had that problem with the few events that we had before. Now, now we've just got something new in. I bought this at an auction in Holland. I don't know if you can see that. Mm -hmm. It's, it's a light box, but these are all hand painted and they're symbols of print. You know, the bookseller, the, the printer, the, the steel plate printer, uh, typesetter or wood carver, book binder. Paper maker. And I guess the paper maker. And when we, one of our trips to London, Leanne and I bought this map. It's from 1799, London. And the reason we bought it mainly was it actually had the houses listed in the part of London that George Clymer was living at, Finsbury Street. I probably can't find it now. <laughs> it's just, a, it's, it's an intaglio map. And uh, it's just, well, it's just a wonderful piece of history. So That's you could amazing. actually go here and you could actually see the house number. He was at number one and then he moved, or is that number 10 and then moved to one and then one to 10. And then we actually walked around that area. The buildings are all gone now. It's in Islington, not, they don't call it Finsbury anymore. So we added that to our collection. I love it. Nick, we're coming up on our hour. I wanna say thank you for an absolutely amazing tour. Liana, you started us off strong. I want to say thank you to you as well. Thank you. Thank you to thank everyone. Thank you for inviting us. It was a it was a real pleasure and an honor. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, I'm so blown away. Thank you both. You're very welcome. I know, Carrie, I think we'll have to um, all figure out how we get our bus tour to go up there. Like, <laughs> Nick and Liana, you have to be prepared for us all to visit now. <laughs> we'd, not, we'd like nothing better than that. Yeah, it's, I, hey, um, it's incredible there. Like this is only scratching the surface. What is that press? Is that a golden red press? <gasps> Which one? <laughs> oh, that one. Oh, yeah. Well, you, the time's up. You have to put another quarter in. Oh, <laughs> well, what, what I'll do is I'll do a quick recap. And then anyone who sticks around gets to hear about the golden, golden red press. <laughs> um, now, if anybody has to leave us, I want to say thank you so much. I've put in the chat 
the Howard Ironworks, the American Printing History Association, the Hamilton Hang, the Become a Member, the Go to Ways Goose, um, because I wanna say thank you so much. Carrie was not wrong. Our members allow this to happen to do the programming like this. So American Printing History Association, we're so glad we could partner with you um, because you do so much good work. And we're glad that we could help uh, share with our Hamilton Hang people. Yeah. But dun, 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 we, I have nowhere to be right this second. And I would love to know more about that golden red press. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So if you have a minute, Nick, I, we won't complain. Yes. <laughs> okay. Uh, well, there's a bit of a story with this one, too, if I can figure out how to use this. We hoped there would be a story, I think. <laughs> well, it, it was also a train wreck when we got it. It's, uh, it's a uh, Alden uh, press, which uh, you've, you, there's quite a few of these kicking around, and a lot of museums have these model presses. They were made, I think, originally in uh, Philadelphia, and then uh, later by Alden in Cincinnati. And then I know they were made in the UK as well. Anyway, when we got this press, when I said it was a train wreck, it was, it was really a train wreck. And not only that, um, uh, let me see if I'm doing this right. Not only that, a uh, lot of things like these, uh, the roller brackets here were, were gone. Uh, we had to make some new trucks that's, Nothing unusual. We have to do a lot of repairs to this, but it was such a beautiful little machine. Still a piece of junk, really, as a button. But it was so beautiful. We said we've got to save it. But somebody had spray painted with a spray can. One side of the machine was gold for some reason. Not the whole thing either. It was just like a, a little bit of spray left. And the other side was red. So when I finished it, we said, well, what color are we going to paint? We haven't painted anything gold before. How about we do that? We've, we've got laughed at for painting that Colombian pink. So we decided, well, you know what? We'll, uh, we'll paint this one gold and see what happens. And we added the red, uh, red touch. So that's how it ended up being gold and red. We have no documentary proof that it was ever that color. It's amazing. I think those stories are perfect, right? I think that gives it like, and you definitely notice it when you walk by. <laughs> well, it's nice to have a machine also finished and working and repaired properly. So, and not disgustingly filthy. I grew up with all these dirty machines my whole life. And I guess it was all about making them look like they were new. That was the whole idea of selling used equipment. If you're going to make them look like they were baffed out, no one was going to buy anything. So I think now you get a lot of people in museums that just love the uh, patina of the old machines. But a lot of these that we've had, like this one here, the whole base, the crucifix base was rotted out. There was things growing in it. So <laughs> as much as we wanted to save it, it wasn't practical to save it. Mm -hmm. You know, no one was gonna climb all over that. And uh, so we, we just carried on and continue doing that this this one here this uh uh this adams which again uh quite a few of these around not a lot but a few uh, uh, a really nice one at the museum of printing uh this one had a big crack in it here and uh big plates with holes in it to basically keep it together we got this in utah so we decided to fix it and we sent it out to a specialist welder we had because we do welding here but this required a little bit more expertise, more nickel. And uh, we returned it back to what it would have looked like when it was new. And we also, when we got it, this was missing. And all we had was that. And we kept looking at it and saying, what the heck is that? Is it just a foundry mark? And then uh, one of our guys figured it out. It's a uh, dovetail. And so it was really easy to take the plate off. And when we did that, we searched and luckily enough, this one had a stamp part uh, serial number. So we used the 308 number and uh, we reproduced this plate from a photo of another one. And uh, we turned it back into a real machine. Carrie has a good question. How can we support Howard Ironworks and how can we keep updated? 
um, because that is very good to know. Well, I think we're getting to, we, we don't really need any financial support. Uh, I don't want to make it sound like it's frivolous. Of course, everything costs money. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, we'd be in, really concerned about making sure that these equip these machines, because we've actually got more machines than we can actually absorb in our museum right now, mm -hmm. that we'll have a place for these machines to go, whether to be used or to be displayed or, or whatnot. And, and that's why we really want to be engaged with the community, because sooner or later, if we have some machines we got, we have to let go, uh, we will. Uh, mm -hmm. We sell the odd machine uh, just because somebody comes along and wants one. We sold one a little while ago to a large company in Chicago. They make catheters, but they started off as printers and they're creating a display in their lobby and they had to have a certain kind of press. And I guess he found us on the, he kept driving me nuts until I would sell it to him, but that <laughs> does happen but I'd like to see some of the letterpress community have some machines that, that, so we have a place for them to go. Otherwise there won't be a place for them to go. That's great. Well, this is the right communities. So I'm glad we um, connected. Yeah. Um, people might be interested in seeing some of those litho stones you have displayed on the back wall there. I can do that. We, we got uh, a, reasonably large collection of 500 stones uh, donated to us from the former manager of one of Toronto's largest uh, printing companies, offset printing companies. Uh, and uh, I've actually got their letterhead here on one of the stones, Rolf Clark Stone. That building is still there on Carlock. And they were obviously a stone printer at one time. So we had to go fetch these up at uh, a farm. They were all uh, sandwiched between newspapers and whatnot to save them because a lot of these um, are, have a lot of Canadiana and, and, and as you may, I don't know if you realize, you have so much history and stuff popping up all the time, Americana, but in Canada, there's, there's really not a lot. So anytime you can get a little bit of Canadian history, this is a famous Canadian company still around today, Robertson, the Robertson screw, the square head screw. Uh, we, we like to keep it here. And some of these, these right reading ones that you're looking at right now, they would have been printed on an offset press similar to that, metan that stone press, that uh, metal decorating press I showed you, because you'd have to transfer to a blanket. The wrong reading ones, of course, they could be printed on any typical proof press like uh, uh, printing press like this. So we, we took some of the better stones. We made this stand. Um, it's really sturdy. We wanted to design it so you didn't have them. Uh, they weren't going to be able to fall over if some child had tried to climb up and it's really hard to climb up. Mm -hmm. And they're, they're visible, so people can come by and, and just look at them. That company, Toronto Type Foundry, my dad worked at in Toronto. That's amazing. And they were, they were in business over 100 years. Wow. And that, comp that there was interesting. W.H. Scraggy, never heard of them before. Found out they were one of the biggest department stores in Quebec. Closed, I think, in 1920. Wow. So, so some of the stones are, you know, I guess I could print this diploma for myself if it doesn't work out here. <laughs> <laughs> and, and Nick, actually, if you, if you do have just a couple more minutes, someone asked if you can show the Cincinnati newspaper press. Oh, um, of course. Because they're down, they're down in Cincinnati. <laughs> oh, absolutely. Yeah, we love this machine. Uh, and it's complete too. So we're very fortunate. Um, it's made in Cincinnati. It's got the beautiful, beautiful fluted uh, cast columns. Uh, that's the original fly, but all the sticks we made because uh, some were broken, we couldn't match them up. So we made them all. Uh, that's the original wo wo uh, wood takeoff wheel. It's a continuous revolution or a country press. It's just like the potter that uh, 
that we looked at earlier. Um, the, the roller locks are there. Um, and there's a seller's name. This, was, this guy was a dealer down in Atlanta, I think. Um, don't know much about them. And I don't know if that they put that on years after it was made. I think they did from the looks of it. They might have resold it. So we restored this whole machine. And uh, we haven't printed on it. We almost don't want to because we finished it off. It runs very well. It has fast and loose pulleys. So it would have been on a drive shaft at some point in its life. But um, with a bigger flywheel, that's a little small to turn by hand. You can turn it by hand, but a bigger flywheel, you, it could be turned just been a manual machine. It's a, just a beautiful piece of machinery. And a lot of people don't realize how important Cincinnati was to a lot of things from, from slaughterhouses to machinery, to inks, to everything. I saw Jacob and Gary both joined us from the Cincinnati uh, Type and Print Museum today. Um, so that was a nice treat to show that off. Thank you. Oh, I'll, make sure this, I'll make sure they see their name now. <laughs> there we go. Oh, that's wonderful. <laughs> And Paul Moxon even asked if there's a library, which I did see earlier. Um, is that a thing that you can request access to or, or yeah, what, um, how does your library work there? Well, it's pretty simple. Just promise you won't steal the books and then you can come in. <laughs> That's a good way to do it. <laughs> this is just, uh, this is not, not a super big library, but uh, Leanna designed it, did a beautiful job. And it's all print related. So you don't come in here to read a reader's digest or something. It's all print. So we keep our periodicals on this side that you're looking at now. The foreign language ones are on the left in the cupboard. And, and then we got storage underneath. And then we have over here, technical books, type books, uh, machinery man books, not too many manuals. I keep them somewhere else. And this is uh, biographies about companies here. And then we had our book binder make up some special binders for us. So when we get stuff, we don't know where to put it. We, uh, we made up individual binders for information on companies. So whatever we get, a leaflet or brochure, or something, we can throw it in there. That's amazing. That's an old machine too, this Britannia. I've seen one of these in California, but it was a little bit different than this. This one we know is before Queen Victoria, the House of Hanover. Uh, we have a serial number, which we're lucky to get, but things were missing. These were missing. We made those, the crest is, not technically the right crust. It's not the House of Hanover, it's Victoria. Mm -hmm. Hanover has another shield right inside the center shield, but we managed to get that from something else. And we got some help with this with, from the Rylands Library in Manchester and the museum in Melbourne, Australia has one. And they were very helpful because they, they uh, sent us photos of theirs because all the back of this machine was was missing or broken. I, I think there was a bit of a mangle. So a lot of these parts here we made from scratch. And we ended up unfortunately having to change the main taper uh, shaft. It's actually tapered because the other original cast was broken. Uh, finished the frisket and it's, it's fully working now. That's amazing. Um, so we do have to wrap up on our end. I apologize. I think what it means is we all have to now plan our visits to come see you, Nick and Leanna, in person. And Absolutely. I do want to remind everybody, if you are a regular ham hanger person, um, we are not having one next week since it is a holiday weekend. So, uh, but we do have one on September 10th with Alexander Landerman at Indiana University. He's going to show us around there and he's going to show us some of his work. So. 
Um, that's my friendly reminder that if you normally come every Friday, we hope that you have a wonderful next Friday and we will not see you. Um, so I, I wanna say thank you again. This was amazing. If we haven't already clapped, I think everybody clapped three times now after they picked their jaws up off the ground. Um, thank you so much for showing us your beautiful collection. You're very welcome. The book. Thank you so much. Thank you again for inviting us. Yeah. Thanks, Stephen, for thinking of it, for, for putting it together and being the catalyst. Uh, AFA, we're so happy that um, you brought this to our attention and, and helped us help us be a part of it. Thank you. Well, have a good weekend, everyone. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Yes, have a good weekend. I will see you all in two weeks. Thank you. Have a wonderful uh, time. We will see you later. Thank you again. Bye, all. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.